These projects are designed to cultivate multiple skill sets that complement a series of videos created for the purpose of acquiring a foundational knowledge of the Python programming language. These projects will cover code in both console-based and GUI applications. TK Enter is a Python binding to the TK GUI toolkit, and its framework is built into Python's standard library, so it does not require the installation of any additional modules. This makes TK Enter a convenient choice for building graphical interfaces for Python applications. All source code in these videos is available at the one byte at a time GitHub repository. You will find a link to the code used in each video beneath it, in its description and comment section. You may use these links to download the source code. This is a hopefully fun project. It's a Python TK Enter Blackjack game. And I don't really know that much about Blackjack, but I googled some of the rules. Got to play to 21. Whoever gets the closest to 21 wins, the dealer or the player. You can't go over 21 or you bust and you lose. Uh, you can choose to draw. You can take a hit. And most casinos tell their dealers to stop. If they're 17, then they'll stay at that point and they won't draw a new card. So you could code yours with different rules. You can use different logic. I just use what I found on Google. But I thought it would be a fun project. So let's take a look at it. The Python TK Enter GUI. All right, so here's an interface, and you could theme it any way you want. I just made wanted to make it a little cutesy, so I used some MLP main characters here. <laughs> but um, it's got a menu, several widgets here, and then help. And if we click start, let's let's see what happens. Welcome to Casino Unicornio, every pony. So I'm going to enter my name, and then I made it very verbose, so when we step to the code, as you play the game, you'll be able to see what's happening, but here it's just building a list or an array, a deck of 52 card objects, and we have a card class, so each of these cards is an object that has both a numerical and a face value, and it tells you what it does, and then it says, click the deal button to continue. All right, let's make a deal. So, so far all the cards are hidden. Click go to continue. How much will you wager? And then here's what I get. And then how much will I bet? So uh, really low at this point. I, I have very little chance of going over or busting. I, I couldn't even if I, if I wanted to bust. So I'm going to, uh, in this case, I'm going to bet the maximum amount. And of course I'll want to take a hit. Do you want a hit or will you stay? So notice it, you know, in text here, I had it display my hand, total point six. The dealer's hand, now, the, the dealer, this is just what I Googled, but they have one card hidden. Uh, so this is sort of a, that makes the game more challenging because you can't tell whether you want to take a hit or whether you want to stay. You don't know how much the dealer has. But if you want to cheat, you can cheat. So you click this button here. Cheaters never prosper. Big fat cheater. And then that shows all the dealer's cards. And that way you can see the dealer's points. And then it's coded so that, you know, in the game, an ace can be a 1 or an 11. Well, if you're going to bust, you want that ace to be a 1. But if if not, then you want that to be an 11. So in this case, it just says that here. And then do I want to hit? I do not want to stay because my point value is too low. Take a hit. Do you want to hit or will you stay? Well, in this case, let's see. I've got 16 points, right? A queen is worth 10, 4, and a 2. And then these, again, these are all just label widgets with the image values being set. When we walk through the code, you'll see how it works. But uh, And then the dealer's hand, because we're cheating, we can see all the dealer's cards, but normally we wouldn't be able to. Um, so cheaters never prosper. And then our, our dealer's twilight, but it looks like our dealer has busted here. So in this case, if both of those were 11, that would be 22 and then it would be 26. So what we coded in our game logic is that if, if either the dealer or the player busted and they have an ace in their hand, then convert that ace from 11 to a one and that would save them. So that way, instead of having 11 plus 11, which would be 22 plus four, which would be 26, 
when we go up here, right, that was the dealer's hand here, then our code runs and we'll convert that to a one. And so instead, the dealer's hand, if both of these are an 11, if one of these becomes a one, then that's gonna be 11 plus one is 12, plus four is 16. And that logic, all right, that code will work in favor of either the player or the dealer, okay? So in this instance, me having my 16 and the player having their 16, it's a tie. So I really have no, no choice here, but... Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's take a hit and see what happens. Ah, I busted 26 and I don't have an ace. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Click go to continue. So I click Charlie, go. Charlie, you busted. You lose this round. All right, so determining a winner, I busted, I lost because I went over 21, right? My queen and my queen, my uh, queen of spades and the queen of hearts here, that's 20, 24, and then 26 points. So look at the closing hands. Here's my closing hand, 26 points. Here's Twilight's hand. And we're converting Twilight's, one of Twilight's aces to a one instead of 11. So she only has 16. So she won. I busted. She won. And then notice what happened. The money that I bet, it came out of my cash. And then the dealer won the pot. So the dealer's got 150. And the dealer gets a win, and I don't. Okay, so, well, let's try it again. I'll deal again. All right, let's make a deal. So, let's click, go ahead and click go here. How much will you wager? And then I have a queen and a six, right? And then, in this case, I'll go ahead and cheat again. Cheaters never prosper. Big fat cheater. <laughs> so we can look at the dealer's cards, all right? So here's Twilight's hand. She's got 15 points. And I've got 16. Um, what am I going to bet? I'm going to be a little more conservative this time and only bet 25. Do you want to hit or will you stay? All right, and then we're just doing some validation here, some masking. We check, make sure that it was, they didn't enter something weird that wasn't a number or a value or money that, or they didn't have, or if they tried to make a bet that was too large and they didn't actually have that much money in, in their holdings. There's lots of things we have to check for in the code when they enter a bet. And when we walk through the code, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So Twilight, the dealer asks us, do we want to hit or do we want to stay? These are my points, 16. And we can see all of Twilight's points. She's got 15, but only because we're cheating, right? I turn the cheat on. So it's kind of like I'm playing blackjack in God mode uh, as much as you could play blackjack in God mode. Um, I'm going to take a hit. Well, I just busted again. <laughs> a jack and a queen, that's 20, and then I've got six points, and neither of those are an ace, uh, those face cards, so I can't convert anything to a one, so I'm just dead. All right, so 26, somebody wins, somebody loses, click go to continue. Sorry, Charlie, you busted. You lose this round. And then I had 26, Twilight had 15. Oh my goodness, she's just, she's just wiping the floor with me. She's bleeding me dry. All right, one last time. All right, let's make a deal. All right, I'll click. How go. much will you wager? I'm gonna bet ten dollars this time. I got sixteen. What are the odds I'm gonna bust again if I go over a bit? Do you want to hit or will you stay? And a valid American value was entered. Do I want to hit or do I want to stay? I have sixteen points. Twilight's cards are hidden. I'm gonna cheat again. Maybe it's because I'm cheating. That's why I have cheaters such a bad luck. never prosper. Big fat cheater. All right, so now I know Twilight's got 16, and I've got 16. It's a tie. I really need a win. If I bust, oh well. I'm going to take a hit. Oh, yes. I didn't bust. I'm at 19. Oh. Okay. So let's see what happens if we cheat. I've got my 19, but somebody wins, somebody loses. What? What's got to... That's Twilight. She nailed a perfect 21. Oh my gosh, she's a card shark. Go to continue. I nailed it with a perfect 21. Yes, yes you did. Well, that's it for me. Anyway, and it just changes this image down here as you go. So that's just a basic blackjack game. It's a fun project you could do in uh, Python to Kenter. The Python, Python TK Intercode. 
using a TK Enter GUI interface. I'm by no means uh, a gambler or even a card player. Um, I have no poker face whatsoever. <laughs> I had to Google the rules because I wasn't sure about the rules for blackjack. Uh, so I might be wrong here, but, but my logic, basically the idea of the game and what we have to code in this project is that the player and the dealer play cards and all of these cards have point values, okay? And then the face cards have a value of 10, except for the ace card, which can either be 11 or converted to one in a hand if the player is over uh, you know, the maximum point value. The maximum point value is 21. If the dealer or the player get 21, that's an instant win. They nailed it, all right? If they are both under 21 and they both decide to stay, which means they're not gonna take cards anymore, then whoever has the highest point value up to you know, 20, you know, not 21, because 21 would be an instant win, that person would win, dealer or player. And if either the dealer or the player goes over 21, they bust. And if they busted, that's an instant lose, okay? Now, ace is a special card in your hand because it can either have a point value of 11 or one. And it depends. If your points are over 21 and you've busted, and you're that's normally an instant lose, but you happen to have an ace in your hand, you can convert that ace from an 11 to a one, and that can save your bacon, so to speak, in the game. Uh, so that is my understanding based on what I could Google of the rules, and that is the logic that we want to code into this uh, Python TK Enter blackjack game. Now, the GUI, you know, the theme, you can make it whatever you want to make it. Um, of course, I wanted little cutesy MLP characters and things that, you know, you could theme however you like. We're going to need some modules for this, all right? So for regular expressions, we're going to import from RE, uh, TK Enter for our graphical interface and message box code, uh, list from typing, and then for our image objects, which will be both our cards, and also we'll display the little pictures of the dealer you know, different images or different faces. And you could, you know, you could get really creative with this and have, you know, different JPEGs, the dealer making different faces and things. But basically we're just gonna use some TK labels and the image attribute property, which would basically make it work like a picture box and a C++ MFC app or a Java application. So we can then use them to display images, those, those TK labels with that image attribute. So we're importing from image TK and image because we want to be able to resize them to fit the dimensions of our window. And also we want to use some anti-aliasing to sort of improve the image quality. Otherwise, when we resize them, they would tend to get really distorted. Okay, OS to detect the operating system. And then play sound, remember that's our module. And also remember that you, and that you don't want the latest, greatest play sound. I found lots of bugs and things where it doesn't work correctly uh, in Python applications. It doesn't work with threading, doesn't work in asynchronous mode properly. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. So I would recommend uninstalling play sound if you've already installed it, the most latest, greatest modern version, and instead install the previous version 1.2.2. Uh, that's the version I'm using in these examples in these projects and I've had no problems with that version. And if you haven't already installed it, it's just a pip away. Just pip, install, play sound, and then version evaluates, you know, equals equals uh, 1.2.2, okay? Threading, because remember, whenever you use a TK Enter GUI interface, uh, everything runs inside of a main loop. All those widgets, they listen for events or triggers. When they hear that trigger or that event, they go call the corresponding event handler method that you wrote to handle that event. And all that runs inside of main loop continuously. That's how Windows work. And believe it or not, that's how MFC applications work. And that's how Java graphical applications work and, and C Sharp. And they all work in a similar fashion in the sense that your GUI runs in a, a continuous loop and all the widgets or components or whatever you will call them in whatever language 
you're developing in, they all listen for events. And when they hear the trigger, they go call the corresponding function that you wrote to handle uh, what happens when that trigger is detected. So you don't want to do anything that is, uh, you know, resource intensive, memory wise or CPU wise, uh, inside of the main loop that your GUI is running in. If you do, then say you loop or you do a, an intensive process, you launch an intensive process, it will lock up your GUI every time. And the end user won't be able to interact with the window or the GUI. Uh, you know, they'll, it'll stop responding. They'll click on something and it won't respond. And that's not just true with Tiki Enter and Python. That's also true with Java and true with C++ MFC applications. So when you get into graphical programming, GUI programming, you also need to get into multi-threading so that you can then launch other processes and threads that are outside of the main loop thread that your GUI is running within. And we're also going to import random. We're going to need some random number functionality to you know, emulate or simulate drawing a card from the deck, right? We have to shuffle the cards. Well, we're going to write a card class that will have all the face values and the point values of our cards. We're going to build a deck of cards, which will be a list or an array, and we'll hold all those cards within it. And we'll use, we'll generate random numbers to randomly select a card. And then we'll have to track that card and remember which card we drew out of the list, out of the array, out of the deck, uh, so that we, you know, we can't allow that card to have a duplicate. We can't allow it to be drawn again. So every face value, every point value, we have to keep track of. And we, as, as the player or the dealer draws those cards, we have to subtract them from our deck. Here, outside of our, our class definition, um, we're going to get a context for building our TK enter window, our main frame, okay? So that's what window is. It's just sort of our handle to access that. We're going to set the title of our main frame window, the width and the height in these variables here. Then we're going to call from our instance of TK Enter uh, W info screen width and W info screen height to get the, the width and height of the screen. We don't know this. This element is variable. It's dynamic at runtime. We know the end user can have any combination of width and height on their display. Uh, so. This code is to sort of be, be able to handle that randomness because we don't know what resolution they'll be running it at. So we'll do a little bit of math here and store it inside of this variable up here in the middle, which will be used to make our window appear in the middle. So we have a regular expression here. We have screen width minus the window width, and we have screen height minus the window height, and we divide both by two. And then when we do that, we call the geometry method on our instance of TK enter and pass in our variable. And that will cause our window to appear in the middle of the screen. And because we use place and absolute positioning in this example, uh, we're going to make it not resizable. So the width and the height set to false, it's not resizable. And the background, it will, will make it black. Get a lot more control with place and absolute positioning over the x, y coordinate, the width and the height. Um, it may not be dynamically sized, but it gives us the control that we want for our interface. But because of that, uh, we're not going to let the end user resize it. That would, you know, that would make things appear not where we want. We initialize this object here, GUI. It's a variable. It's set to null, right? None is the Python version of null like in C++ or Java, but um, that, this is going to act as a pointer. If you're familiar with uh, C++ as a programming language, uh, you're familiar with pointers. So basically, you know, Python implements pointers. It has memory management and passing by reference and all sorts of, of uh, C++ type things built in, but it kind of hides the mechanics from us. So that way it sort of reduces the complexity of the language and makes it easier to learn and to use. But if you could open up the hood and peek under the hood, the structure of this, this, this functions almost like a global pointer. So it's sitting there, it doesn't do anything. But in our, our game, 
what's going to happen is way down here, let's scroll way down here. We take that, okay, and we're going to initialize blackjack. Well, blackjack is a class, all right? It's, it defines our graphical user interface, our GUI, and all of our widgets and components that we add to it. So we're going to instantiate or build an object. A class is just a blueprint of something defined with code. And when you instantiate uh, something from a class, then you actually set up resources. You consume memory, CPU cycles. You assign resources to it and you build it. So think of a class definition as a blueprint, but think of building or instantiating the class as actually the construction crew arriving at the work site and building that skyscraper or that building from the blueprint that you defined with code. So GUI here, it was set to null, it was set to none in Python. Now that's that sort of global pointer, we're going to instantiate, build a blackjack GUI object and assign it to GUI. And then we can use GUI like you would use a pointer in C++ to manipulate that object, to access it in memory, do things to it and get things from it and so forth. And as an argument or a parameter, to the constructor, which is a special method called whenever you build a class. It's always defined with underscore, underscore, and underscore, underscore in Python, unlike Java and C++ where it just has the same name as the class. But in this case, as an argument or a parameter to the constructor, we're going to pass in window. And remember that window, it's just a handle to our instance of TK enter, okay? TK enter module. And then we're gonna call main loop and when we do this, right, um, when you call main loop, uh, it basically gets all of those widgets listening for events and builds and displays the window. So let's, that's sort of the, you know, the things that happen first are the, the basics here. Now let's scroll up top. We have some classes. So let's take a look at our classes. Here's a class definition for a card. And we'll build these cards later. Cards have numerical values. So these are all variables that we can use to assign a point value. But in this case, it's not the point value of the card because, but in this case, it's we're using these as a symbolic constant. So in other words, it doesn't have, to, it doesn't really relate to the point value of the card. It just needs to be a unique value as a symbolic constant. And then we're assigning it to a variable. So this, from a human perspective, is more meaningful to us than these numbers. Like we could just use the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 14 to represent a unique value for each type of card object. But that would get very confusing to have these represent the card and then to have another number that's different from it represent the point value of that card. That'd be kind of confusing. So. You wouldn't have to do it this way, but in this case, we're setting these up as symbolic constants, okay? And then the face values, we're doing the same thing. They're just numbers, just a variable that points to an integer, but uh, the value that it holds, it will be more meaningful to us if we can code it as spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. Well, Python doesn't know that. So we're just using integers and they just need to be unique values. Just need to make sure that they're not the same. So zero, one, two, three. We just want to make sure none of those are the same. And then two through fourteen. We just want to make sure none of those. And then we can use these as symbolic constants, okay, to represent our card class object. And then for card instances, the card initially it's null, it's nothing. The face initially it's nothing. Point value zero. Drawn from the deck false that's a boolean value there so uh, remember that a class combines everything that an object is its attributes with everything that it does its methods and its functions it's a way of encapsulating or combining everything into a programming structure so we do all that we define the card class and then when we build a card all that code can be reused. We don't have to constantly reinvent the wheel. It ends up being much less code to use classes and hierarchies than not to. So that's that's one of the benefits of classes. So all of this is part of a card. And once we've defined it, we can just 
make 52 of them or however many we want and then have a deck of cards. The constructor okay, the of a class is always method. prefixed with well, two underscores and then the keyword in it and then postfix with the two trailing underscores. The or Example. Has the same name as the class, but in Python, it's different. Instead, it, you're going to define a method underscore, underscore, and that underscore, underscore. You're almost always going to pass in self to methods inside of a class. You need that. It works sort of like the this pointer does in C++. If you've if you're familiar with C++, but you need it to refer to data members, objects defined within the class itself. Um, we're going to pass in some other arguments here, the card number, the card face, and whether or not it's drawn. So a Boolean and some integer values we will accept as parameters to our constructor every time we build a card. And remember, this is a way of setting up default parameters or values. So it gives us the choice we could you know pass in these arguments when we construct a card class object from this class definition or if we choose not to or if we forget to it'll get these default values deuce the face value hearts and it won't be drawn the drawn the boolean value will be false and in the constructor we just take what's passed in as a parameter and assign it using the self attribute here we can access these data members here, okay? So the card, the face, drawn. We need to take self as an argument to do that. And the point value would be zero. So that's how every single card class object starts out. So this is what a card is. These data members here, that's, that's what a, a card class object is. Now, what can a card class object do? Remember, a class combines both what an object is and what an object does. Well, here's a function, a method, and its purpose is to present or display the data members of a card. So what is a card's face value? What is its point or numerical value? Has it been drawn from the deck or is it in the deck? You know, these are the attributes we would want to display. And so here, text-wise, we're just setting that, okay? And we look at this attribute, the card, and if it's a deuce, three, four, or five, all the way to ace, we will convert that symbolic constant into string text, okay? So if it's an ace, you know, in this case, it has a value 14 as a symbolic constant. Well, to make it easier for us to code and to work with as a human, we just can call it ace. The computer sees it as 14. It just needs to be a value different and unique from the other uh, card and face values, but we see that as an ace. So 14 ace gives it a string value and then a corresponding point value for every card. So all the numerical cards correspond to their number and then the face cards after 10, if we go jack, queen, king, ace, they have a point value accordingly. And remember with this ace here, later on in our logic, we're going to have to provide the ability to convert it to a one, uh, you know, uh, from an 11 to a one, if either the dealer or the player has too many points, if they're over 21 and they have busted. So it displays the point value. It displays the string text corresponding to the card. And here it's going to display the face value as text. Again, using symbolic constants. Okay. And then it will just return that. And I brought this over, I actually have, have a console project, Blackjack project, that I think you should do first before you do the TK enter one. Uh, but I brought it over so that I, I try to use like maximum verbosity in these projects. And there's a method or a reason for that. The more verbose the project, the more transparent it is, the more you can see what the application is doing, the easier it is to follow, the more you can learn from it, the more you can study its behavior. So, you know, you wouldn't have to really do all this. Uh, you know, you could just change the graphics. I mean, the logic you'd have to code, but this is just to make, you know, to increase the verbosity or to make it clear and evident what the application, what the game is doing when the end user interacts with it, when the player interacts with it. And then finally, we're just going to return that string and we'll display that in a text widget, a TK text widget. Okay, and that'll just, again, 
verbosely let the end user, the player, know what we're doing, know what the application is doing. All right, so we have our card class. Now we're going to make a card player class. Okay, and think about the things that go with the player, the name, the gender, the age, the money, total points on their hand, score. Do they choose to stay? True or false? They can take a hit or are they going to stay? Uh, dealer, first card. And that's for, you know, it could be the player, it could be the dealer, but we can set that Boolean to determine whether or not it's the dealer or the player. But this way, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can use the card player class for either the player or the dealer. There are attributes defined in the class to deal with the conditions for both. First card. If it's their first card, we're going to code a cheat method into the game. And it'll reveal to the player all of the dealer's cards. If they don't use cheat, a portion of the dealer's cards will remain hidden from the player. It makes the game more challenging because they don't know you know whether to hit or whether to stay um but if if they activate the cheat mode they can see all the dealers cards and then that sort of gives them you know like card counting or clairvoyance gives them an unfair advantage against the dealer they know all the dealers points all the dealers cards and then they could you know play more ruthlessly and so you know we use this as part of that and then here is a list object in python which is really just an array an iterable, an iterable object, uh, or, or an array class type object, but a, a basic Python list. And that hand will be either the dealer's hand or the player's hand. And what we're going to store inside of our list, our array, are instances of the card class, card class objects that we have instantiated. Okay, you see this underscore underscore init. Well, what is that? Remember, that's the constructor of the class. Just like the card class, we have default parameters, default arguments. We can pass in the name, the gender, uh, whether or not it's a dealer, the age, uh, the money they have, or we could just accept the defaults. It's up to the programmer or how we use the code. And then again, we take the self attribute as an argument. And with that self, we can access the data members stored inside the class. Here's all the data members and set them using the constructor. So we've defined a card, wrote a card class. We defined a card player. We wrote a card player class. Now here's our GUI. We're going to build our window and add our widgets. And this class, that's what this was for. Okay. So we have some data members defined within our class. And this is why we imported OS. Uh, this just makes our code a little bit more dynamic because we could add an absolute path, but if, if we did, how do we know the, the end user is not going to move the media files around and then the program won't be able to find it and Python will generate errors and throw exceptions because they move the sound files or the card image files or the, the pony files. So we're going to use OS get CWE to you know get the current working directory and that just and if you code it this way in unc path formatting it just makes it dynamic so it doesn't matter what the drive loader is it doesn't matter what subdirectory the end user might have moved our files around to as long as the relative path remains the same it, it will be able to find it the you know in this case the current working directory that the script is running in and then it will simply recurse or go into the subdirectories and that parent directory and access the child folders. So that's what git cdbd does. You know, again, you could, you didn't, you wouldn't have to import that. You don't have to use relative uh, you know, uh, locations. You could use an absolute location, c colon backslash, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you did, your program would be less dynamic, less able to respond to change or to unforeseen modifications that the end user might make to it. Hence, get CWE, get the current working directory in Python from our OS module that we imported. Now, we're gonna do some other things here. Number of cards, 13, number of faces, four. And you know, these are the actual, you know, from the deuce to all the way to the ace, 11 or one the actual variations of cards we might have. The number of faces, number of cards in a deck, 52. 
I think it's 52 anyway, minus the Jokers. You take the Jokers out, it's 50, the Jokers is 54, right? Again, not a card player at all. Have no idea how to I gamble, but but you could set that. You know, th these are, as these data members, you can play with them. You can change them, change the rules if you want, change the attributes. But we're assuming 52 cards and a deck. Maximum hand size. This is overkill. Your hand's never going to get that big. The dealer's hand's never going to get that big. You would definitely bust before that. So we can make this number much smaller. But I just left it at 20 now because I was thinking of other card games like War or Poker or Go Fish or something. Uh, you know, you, you could code the logic, the rules for those games too. The house limit. I just Googled that. Remember we said the house usually if, if they get to number 17, they stop there. The minimum bet and the maximum bet, okay? So if it was poker, like the ante or the ante up, but this is what, you know, when you've got your cards, and you've got to make a bet and you choose to hit or to stay, this is the range. Minimum is five, maximum is 50. You can play with that. The pot is the accumulated money, in, you know, in a series of, of uh, deals for a particular round of blackjack until either the dealer or the player wins and somebody wins somebody loses and the bet is the current amount of money being bet so this pot the pot is actually an accumulator it will accumulate the value of multiple bets as as the player and the dealer play until somebody wins and somebody loses display all dealer cards it's a boolean that works with our cheat so if the player turns to cheat on, uh, you know, this display all dealer cards is, is normally set to false. So some of the dealer's cards are hidden from the player. The player doesn't know what the dealer has. It makes it more difficult for the player to decide whether to hit or whether to stay. Will they win? Will they lose? How much will they bet? Uh, but if they cheat and we set this to be true, then they have an unfair advantage, you know, clairvoyance, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Or the like card counting. Okay, cheat will start out as false. That's a boolean, but we can set it to true. Animate cards. We can use you know animations of the cards, but we're going to start out with uh, still cards. Dealer photo. There's different photos, image objects we set up for our dealer, and I use cute little ponies. But you could use whatever you want. Your favorite actor or actress or a cartoon character or you know different faces you can create your own and paint or use the gimp or you know photoshop or something it's up to you but you can change and manipulate uh the photo of the dealer based on how it interacts with the player and by changing this number you can change what gets displayed in the tk label image attribute pre-bet and that's just Remember that uh, event-based programming, which is when you use a graphical interface, a GUI, you have to go to event-based logic. It's totally different from console-based logic because you're listening to for triggers, for events, and all these widgets in your window and your frame. And I mean, any random number, the player could click on this or click on that or you know pull this drop-down list and select an item. Or I mean, it's just random. So your logic has to change. The flow of your programming has to change completely. The way you think as a programmer has to, to change when you start using a graphical interface as opposed to console programming. Console programming, you can shepherd. You can manipulate and control uh, with much more precision what the end user does in your application. Not so with a GUI. You have to enable and disable widgets as they apply to certain circumstances. And remember, you know, when a function ends, the values in that function are lost. So with the graphical interface, you have to provide something outside the scope of that function to maintain the value. When they click a button or access a, a combo list or a drop-down box, um, if you don't, then that value will be lost. And also, you, you there are plenty of times with a, a GUI you don't want the same thing to happen every time they click a widget, a button, or select the drop-down box. You want different things to happen contextually based on the context of what they're doing in your program. So that requires a lot of decision structure coding and 
a lot of you know coding to with things like globals or variables outside that function to maintain the value so that the same thing doesn't happen every time they interact with that widget or you know what you want from your interface okay another, more booleans is the game over predetermine when and deal initial hand all these will be used uh, in the game itself okay now we have another list array type of object deck of cards and it's initialized to be null so i haven't built the cards yet but this is stored in our gui class it's a data member this list will itself hold instances of the card class but all of that is a data member of our gui class okay we have a player and a dealer and we're going to instantiate or build a card player object along with our card objects so we have two classes that are instantiated as objects that then become data members of this third class our gui our graphical interface and let's go and look at just defining the gui this string variable is the bet text that goes to a tk entry object or widget and that just you know they type in how much they're going to bet we have to take it in as a string convert it to an integer so we can add it or accumulate it and do some math with it that's all that is but before we go through the rest of this let's look at defining our basic interface um so let's go way down here this is where you would start with a, a GUI, a graphical interface, you start with your interface first, okay? You have to define your your interface. Let me go, let's see. Let's go up here and we'll start defining our interface here. All right, so our main window, our TK enter master frame, the parent window and from this we could launch child windows but that's defined here what appears when we first instantiate our instance of tk enter and launch the application that's frm underscore main underscore window frame main window and we'll use this as the parent uh, to which we attach all of our widgets that we want to add to our interface. So we build it, we use absolute positioning with place. This is an image object that we defined earlier and we'll go over that code in a moment. And also, these are just project videos, but uh, soon I'll be uploading a, a series of videos going over each individual widget and item inside of TK Enter and each uh, you know, individual object inside of Python and the language itself. So there'll be like short, a series of short tutorial videos going over each one. These projects are just an overall summary, a way to take all of those and all that you've learned and apply it into a larger, uh, more complex project. So if you, you know, if you haven't gone through the, that series of videos yet, you'll want to do that to sort of learn each of these components in Python and in uh, TK Enter. Uh, that being said, let's, let's go ahead and continue summarizing our code. So we have our main window. Master is sort of a, you know, we, we get the, the parent object in this case. And we're gonna build a menu bar. That's the menu bar that appears over our Blackjack game. And we have a file menu, a view menu, and a help menu. This is just to show how to do that, but new, close, cheat, exit. And then we attach it you know, to our main menu bar. That's our parent main menu bar here. See, so when we instantiate a subcomponent, you know, in this case, our file, our view, our help menu, we're attaching it to the main menu bar. And then an item on that, in this case, label, new, command, each of these just like a button or any other widget, each menu item itself has its own event handler function or method. And we'll take a look at those in a moment. Okay, after that, we have a label frame. And this is for player, the player object, okay? 
And these are images, image objects that we defined up above. We'll go over that in a moment. But right now, we're just trying to go through the code where we're actually building uh, our graphical interface, the main window, and adding the widgets to it. And these will be anti-aliased image objects that are defined above. Again, here, we're resizing that. And they will be set as the image attribute inside of some TK labels. Okay. And then to start out with, we're displaying these images, but these will be changed once they click start and they run the game. This is just for the loading screen. You try to make it look fun and, and interesting or pretty when it loads up. But all these will change once the end user, the player, begins to click buttons and interact with our interface. It will call event handlers and all these will change. So these are just our initial startup images right here as we go through it. And then for the dealer portion, we're going to build that. And again, it's always being attached to frame main window. Okay. And then more images. And these are the default images. But again, they too will change as we play the game. The game actions. Okay. So what the player can do, the components, the things that they interact with, again, adding it to the parent object. Add the buttons, start, quit, talk, deal, hit, stay. And then, in this case, the betting portion of our interface. We need to add that to the main window. And then it's a TK entry object. They can enter how much they want to bet. Okay. And then they have a button. Once they've entered it, they can click it. And that triggles, uh, triggles, <laughs> triples. No, that triggers the event handler. Too early in the morning for me. I, I need coffee here. And then there's a go button. And there's the cheat button to activate the cheat. And notice that, you know, there's an event handler. Handle button cheat if they click it. Well, we wrote a function or method that will go handle that code. Down here are the game stats. And this is just the facts and figures. How many wins for the player? How many wins for the dealer? Uh, what's in the pot? What amount of money has accumulated there? You know, what are the points and so forth? The amount of cash the dealer and the player have. So all of those. And then here, the game text output. This is sort of our big main, uh, you know, we had a label frame and a scroll bar. And then within that label frame, we had a text object. And it's kind of weird, but this is just how you add a scroll bar to a text object. You have to add it to a label frame. And once you add that, that scroll bar to the label frame, you can then add another widget like a text. So that's our big text box for our you know, maximum verbosity, our verbose output, so that we can follow along with the code and see what our application, what our game is doing as it does it. Makes it transparent, makes it you know, more clear and easy to follow if we can actually get some output and see what the code is doing when we run it, okay? And then we call this method initialize game. That'll set some initial values, but that defines our graphical interface. And again, remember what it looks like. Remember? So these values pop up initially and they're displayed, but then when the player clicks start. Welcome to Casino Unicornio, every pony. Okay, so they do that. Again, look, it's building or populating our deck of cards. And then click the deal button. All right, let's make a deal. Everything changes, right? Go button. How much will you wager? So I have, in this case, a jack has a value of 10 and a 6. I have 16. I don't know how much the dealer has, but if I wanted to, I could cheat. Cheaters never prosper. Big fat cheater. <laughs> All right, so now I know. Um, eh, at 16, yeah, it's below 17, but yeah, I'm going to risk it. And I'll, I, I'm living dangerously. I'll bet the maximum amount. So I'm going to bet. Do you want to hit or will you stay? All right, I want to hit or will I stay? So I got 16, the dealer's got 8. Well, I'm going to go ahead and take a hit. Oh, 
Look what happened. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Click go to continue. Sorry, Charlie. You busted. You lose this round. Well, I lost. I busted. But... So that gives you an idea of what's going on with the code, right? And there's menu items up here, like, you know, the cheat. Going to try being honest for a change? <laughs> and that would just hide the dealer's card again, but, you know, exit and so forth. All right, so that, that gives you kind of an idea of what's happening with the code. And then to make it even more verbose, I've got output in the console as well to kind of show you what's going on in the code. So that goes over building our interface and the definitions of our classes. Let's scroll all the way back up to our interface here. Our event handlers and our image objects here. All right, so we're back in our Blackjack GUI class. And these, we're setting up our image objects. And this is just going to preload them. So it'll make things run faster. It's going to kind of preload and connect all these, these files, these JPEG files. This is our deck of cards, the images that we display in our deck of cards. All right. And then here's our dealer images. And again, we're just image open. We're preloading and getting these objects ready to display here. Okay. Now uh, we've got some event handler methods okay and and some sounds we're using play sound remember we said that you need to do multi-threading and again the reason is if, if i were to just play a sound uh it would lock up my gui and the player would not be able to interact with the game while that sound was playing so to prevent that every time i play a sound what i need to do is i'm going to refresh my interface and i'm going to launch a new thread a separate thread outside of the thread that main loop is running in with my TK enter widgets and GUI. And then I'm going to start that sound file. And that's what I'm doing all the way down for welcome, want to play. You know, these are all just MP3s that I created with a text to speech engine. By the way, uh, AWS, uh, Amazon has a great free text to speech engine. You can render like 5 million characters of text to speech per month for free. And it's a pretty realistic set of voices they have and their text-to-speech engine. But that's all these are. They're just MP3s that I generated. And then I'm launching a separate thread and I'm playing them inside of a separate thread to prevent my interface from locking up. That's what's going on here. Threading.thread, I don't actually call this. I call this, which launches a separate thread, which then calls the function above it. And I start it here and that way, every single sound that gets played, I don't actually call play sound itself. I generate a new thread and call play sound within that thread outside of main loop. And that keeps my uh, interface responsive, my GUI. And anytime you do that in Python, and not just Python, C++, Java, they all have similar issues with the GUI because of the way that it runs in a loop and listens for event triggers. So when you do you know, a resource intensive process or play some media, you want to do it, always do it in a separate thread. At that point, you have to get into some multi-threading to keep your GUI responsive. So that's all we're doing with sound all the way down. We have fresh here, which is window update and we're using after, okay? And a thousand, so in this case, one second, but we just want to refresh, you know, repaint the background of our interface. We had a couple of methods here, text append and text write. And it's this is just a way in our text object where we could erase everything that's there and then insert text. So we, in this case, we would completely replace that text. Or if we didn't want to do that, if we didn't want to erase the text that was there previously, but we just wanted to append some text to that TK text widget, then this is how we would do it. So I didn't want to write three lines of code or two lines of code every time I wanted to do that. And also I wanted to make, make it that functionality more intuitive. So we just wrote my own methods here, text dependent, text to write, and it takes care of doing that. And then I can just pass a string in as an argument to those methods. New game, this just initializes all of our values that we need. Okay, so state here, we're 
enabling or disabling buttons appropriately for the beginning of a new game, setting the pot and the bet, setting everything back to the default values that they should be. And then we're going to call update holdings, which will display that on our interface, clear our deck of cards, build deck of cards, change dealer picks, and name window. So all those things there called from new game. And we'll go through these methods one by one. This video is going to be so long. <laughs> but, you know, but you'll have the code on GitHub so you can download it and, and go through it uh, as well. New game thread. Okay, so we want to create a new game thread. And that's just going to call new game inside of a separate thread. Again, we we have to at some point get into multi-threading when we use a GUI interface with Tekenter. Initialize game. We're setting some initial values. We clear the player and dealer's hands, clear the deck of cards, tell them what to do, display it in the output text widget, and then set the initial state of our buttons at the initial beginning of the game. You have to think of all these things when you're coding something with the GUI interface. What's the initial state? When they do this, then what? What widgets do I disable? What widgets do I enable? Those are sort of things you have to, you have to think along those lines, right? It changes the whole way that you code a project when you start to use a GUI. Uh, change dealer picks. This is just going to randomly change uh, the image of the dealer as they click and interact with the game just to hopefully make it a little more interesting or entertaining, change that image. You could get more sophisticated with this. You could code and simulate sort of emotion. The dealer gets nervous or fearful. The, the dealer is happy and cheerful. The dealer is angry. You know, make different faces and have them display contextually based on the dealer's condition and whether they're winning or losing in the game. Uh, so it's up to you how you do that, but it, this is just how you would do it. You know, how you would code out changing an image in the game as the, the player interacts with the dealer. And you can base that on lots of different behavior, you know, code different behavior into it. Um, in this case, we're getting an image, which will be the, the current dealer pick. And then here, we're just going to cycle through those images, all right? So we're just accumulating. And as we change dealer photo, it will change, you know, that, that number as it as incremented and goes up, it will change the actual JPEG image that we loaded of the dealer. And that's what you see in, in that bottom, you know, window to the right. Draw blank cards, okay? So we have images of blank cards. And this is just you know, our player cards, and these are labels that the dealer and the, and the player has. And that's when, when our window first loads, it displays all those blank cards. Or if they start an, a new game, you know, or deal a new hand, then all those cards are blank until they draw the cards. So this will just display that blank card image. Update holdings. This calls and refreshes our widgets, our entry and text widgets, our labels, with the values uh, of the variables uh, that each one displays in the GUI, okay? So that's update holdings. And then you notice if they turn the cheat on, whether or not we display the total points in the dealer's hand. Uh, normally the player wouldn't know. Cards would be hidden from them, they wouldn't know. But if they turn the cheat on, not only will they see all the dealer's cards, we'll display all the dealer's points, okay? Now we have to build a deck of cards. So we have our card class objects, but we need a loop to do that, all right? Card starts out as a deuce in this case. And while cards in the deck is less than number of cards in the deck, remember that has a value of 52, we're gonna go through, and what are we gonna do? While card face is less than the number of faces, there's four faces and 52 cards in the deck. So we're going to append the keyword append adds an object to an array. And we just build a card. So to do that, we just use the class name and we instantiate it of card type and card face. Well, card type, what is card type? 
starts out as deuce. So it'll go from deuce all the way to ace. And how or why does that happen? Because we do card type is equal to card type plus one or plus equals one. So we'll go from deuce all the way to ace as we increment card type here. We're just building, 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 and appending to the list, the array of deck of cards. And also, what about card face? Card face starts out as zero, but card face gets incremented, okay? You know, diamonds, spades, clubs, so forth. We'll go through all the face values in the card. So, and this is a nested loop. So, you know, this is gonna happen 52 times, but then what will happen is, Okay, so card in the deck, and this card in the deck, and then card type. So all the way to uh, 52 cards, and then the card type starts out as a deuce and goes all the way up to ace. And then for each one of those cards, each deuce, each three, four, five, jack, queen, king, ace, there's four faces, so we have to nest inside of that. You know, we're, we're stuck on this card type. The first card is a deuce. And we're going to build, you know, uh, spades and hearts and uh, diamonds and so forth as we increment the value here. And we're just going to add that to the card. And that increments the number of cards in the deck all the way to 52. And then when we've gone through four faces, we go to the next card. So deuce, now it's a three. And again, you know, spades, diamonds, hearts, and so forth. And then it goes to a four, you know, jack, queen, king, all the faces, it's nested. So as, e as this changes, as card type changes, four card faces, you know, num faces, it's four, so zero through three, remember the fence post issue, but that's why we have these nested wall true loops here. That's how we build our deck uh, of you know different cards along with their values and their different faces and we'll verbosely display that by using the method display card and we tell the player all right all the cards in the deck click deal to continue we built our deck new hand placing all the cards in the deck and then we will clear the dealer's hand and the player's hand and and the current number of cards, and we have to convert it to a string because it's an integer bit. And this will be the number of cards on their hand, right? Length will give us the number of cards or objects in the list, the array, and we convert that to a string. Okay, resetting the deck of cards. And then after reset, we're just displaying the whole deck of cards with 4x and range, you know, these loops here. We're just gonna go through the deck before reset, after reset. Again, this is what you might consider unnecessary verbosity, but the idea is to make this project a tutorial, a way to learn Python, a way to learn TK Enter. And so to do that, we want to have maximum verbosity, verbosely display everything the game is doing, everything the code is doing as it runs, okay? Draw, how do they draw a card, all right? So while drawn is true, we have to you know, go through the deck, iterate through that list, that array of cards. And if the card has been drawn, if it's true, we need to draw another card. We can't allow them to draw you know, two uh, jack of clubs or two you know, jack of diamonds. Every card has to be unique. And once either the player or the dealer draws a card, we have to mark it as drawn. And this code here, this wall true loop, just goes through the deck and, and if that card is drawn, it goes to the next card, goes to another random card. And that way the dealer or player is always drawing a, a card that has not been drawn. So we don't have duplicates that way, but it's still randomized. So there's an element of luck to the game. Okay, and then once we finally draw the card, we found a card that wasn't drawn, it was set to false. We set drawn to true to make sure that that card cannot be drawn from the deck again until the next uh, hand when the dealer deals out a new hand and then we would reset all those boolean values okay if whoever is dealer is true 
if they're the dealer or false if they're the player. And then we'll say dealer draws, player draws, and we display their, their cards. And if we're cheating, we could see all the dealer's cards. And if, if not, some of those cards are hidden from us. Again, here's our maximum verbosity. There's our message there. Okay. Uh, so what about bet? When we bet, this comes from the event handler of our bet button when they click the bet button. We need to do a little bit of parsing to check to make sure, did, did they actually give us a number? What if they just inputted, you know, dog or cat? <laughs> That's meaningless to our application, our game. It would crash our game. So we're going to check, did they actually input a number? We want to get that. And if, if they did, a valid number was entered, okay? But otherwise, else invalid numerical value. You know, why did you type in cat? Why did you type in dog, stupid? No, I'm just kidding. But we wouldn't say that. But, but you know, this game is by no means completely bulletproof. But you want to try to code in some logic to handle basic mistakes or things like that for the end user. It could be an honest mistake. Maybe they don't understand that it needs to be a numerical value, you know? So that's all we're doing there with is digit. When we get the text, is it numerical? If not, well, we can't accumulate or, or do any math with it. So it's it's not right. Otherwise, if everything's good and it's numerical, they're betting this much, okay? And then if the bet is greater than, uh, you know, what the player has or the bet, is greater than what the dealer money has, you know, you can't, you can only bet what you have in your current holdings. You know, if you only have a hundred bucks, you can't bet 150. Or if you only have uh, 25 bucks, you can't bet 30, you know, so we have to test for that. We have to check for those contingencies and those possibilities. So we take what they bet, we add it to the pot, the dealer matches, the player bets, the dealer matches. So we just add that to the pot and in this case, we subtract from the player and dealer's money what they put in the in the pot. And we have to enable and disable our buttons accordingly, and we display that. Uh, so that's that's what's going on there. We update holdings, display a hand. Now this will have to go through. Uh, there's there's three basic lists or array type objects we're using. One to hold the whole deck of cards. And then there's two more arrays, one array that is the card objects in the player's hand, and the third array, the card objects in the dealer's hand. So display hand will just iterate through that iterable, that list array type object in Python and display either the dealer's or the player's hand, okay? So if dealer is true, we'll display the dealer's hand. And what we'll do is for X and range, and then the length of the number of objects, card objects created in the dealer's hand. However many cards they have, it's dynamic. You know, every time they, they hit, draw another card, their array of cards, their hand gets bigger. So we can't hard code values. We need to base that on the number of objects in the array. So for X and range, we'll start here, and then the length of the objects in the array. And we'll go through their cards. Remember, the first element is always has an index or subscript value of zero in a Python list. So we're going to go through all the cards and their hand, and we'll call, in this case, card hand display card. When we call that method using the subscript value here, x is you know zero, one, two, three, as as however many cards they have, it'll display that textually in the text widget because of our maximum verbosity. It'll also change the image or display the image to JPEG in the TK label based on that, okay? And that's what here, display card image. And for that, card image count. And we're just doing the same thing. That's if, if it's the dealer, but if it's not the dealer, it has to be the player, right? There's only two conditions. So that's down here, and we would do the same thing here. We'll cycle through all of the players in the card's hands, and we will display them with maximum verbosity, okay? And then, is it possible that one of them, you know, won or lost? We'll determine a winner. 
we'll go through that. And also, remember that the first dealer's, uh, normally the, you know, some of the dealer's cards are hidden, okay? So that's what we're doing here. In this case, uh, if, if we're not cheating, first card is hidden, what could it be? Well, card image count is one, and we start at one. So, so we'll remember zero defines the first element in an array, and an array, so we're skipping over that first card, and that way it remains blank, okay? And we just display our cards, okay? That's, that's only if they're not cheating. Oh. On the other hand, if they are cheating, well, you know, cheaters never prosper. They're cheating. And in that case, we start at zero, which would cause it to display all the cards in the dealer's hand. Check for aces. Remember if it's, if they bust, they're over 21. If they have an ace, which is normally a point value of 11, we need to convert it to one for either the player or the dealer. So, you know, whoever, we can reuse this method for both, for either the dealer or the player. They can both make use of this functionality of this method coded this way. If they're over 21, we need to look in their hand and cycle through every single card, okay? Card hand, all right? So total points in hand is over 21, all right? And in this case, if it's not equal to one, right? If whoever card hand the card is equal to card ace, and whoever card hand point value is not equal to one, we gotta make sure that when we're going through their hand, if we've converted an ace to a one, we can't do it twice, you know what I'm saying? So this way, if, if we've al allowed them to convert an ace to a one to save themselves, we're checking for that here by using and. So both have to be true, it has to be an ace, and it can't already be set to one. Otherwise, they've already used their trump card. They've already converted that 11 to that one to you know to prevent themselves from losing the game. So it says, uh, it's over 21, but an ace was found that hasn't already been converted. Maximum verbosity to one point. So let's convert it. So then what happens? That card, that ace was initially created with a point value of 11. But if it hasn't already been set to, then we set it to the value of one, okay? And then once we do that, we have to recalculate the point value of all the cards in their deck. So for X and card hand, whether the dealer's hand or the player's hand, once we've done the conversion, we recount the points. So they were over 21, we converted that 11 to a one, and now whatever their point value is, they, they shouldn't be over 21, so they still have a chance. So that's where we code the basic logic for that under check for aces. Display card image. This just takes care of displaying the card, okay? And these are different image objects, the ones we preloaded above. And it, whether or not we're cheating, if dealer's first card is blank card in case cheat is activated, and then deactivated in mid game. If, if cheat is false, we're gonna set a blank card for the dealer. And that way the, the player can't see all the dealer's cards. Makes it a little bit more challenging if they don't know all the points or the cards that the dealer has. And then if whoever is dealer, and this is, these are all just the label objects on the dealer's side and the image objects that we're setting and displaying, okay? So um, whoever, if whoever dealer is false, so excuse me, so the players, uh, you know, labels and image objects displayed in those labels. And then if it's the dealer, the dealer's image objects displayed inside those labels. Those are the, the six you see when we launch and load the TK window. Deal out initial hands, we're setting some default values. Also update holdings and change dealer picks to change the image and update the those widgets, those labels with the values of our variables. And then we're gonna clear any hands they have to deal out the initial hand and they have to draw. And this method here 
will take care of them drawing cards from the deck. And this itself is within a loop, so number of cards to start with, in this case two. You could play with that, you could change it to different values uh, up at the top of the, the class, but my value is set to two. So the dealer and the player both start with two cards, okay? Happens two times, they draw a card from the deck. We'll take a look at the draw method soon. Remember we have to parse or convert anything that's an integer value, which would be returned from length for the number of objects in the list and the array, have to convert it to a string to display it. Otherwise, it'll throw exceptions, generate errors. We've drawn the cards and then we'll display their hand. After we built the hand, which draw will do for us, display hand will go through that list, that array, and show us all the cards and their hand, the card objects. And then, you know, there's a Boolean dealt initial hand set to true. So what is deal? This just gets called when they click the deal button. It tells the player what to do, you know, hit or stay, and then update holdings. Of course, we're playing our sound, sound hit or stay. Dealer reaction. Well, this method or function is, is invoked so that after the player has, you know, made a bet and after they've just decided to hit or stay, the dealer can react to it. Determine winner. Again, what are the possibilities? Uh, if if the player decides to stay and we close the game and both the dealer and the player have the same number of points, it could be a tie. If neither one of them hit 21, neither of them busted and went over 21, and they stay and they we close the game, whoever has the highest number of points wins. And if someone busts, they instantly lose. Uh, if they If they go over 21, and they can't convert an ace to a one. Uh, and likewise, if someone hits or nails a perfect 21, they instantly win. So that's that's all that's happening in this code here. Hit, we're just drawing another card from the deck, okay? Help, this is just an event handler. When you call the help menu, displaying it. Cheat, here's the cheat. It will manipulate and change the value of our Boolean and it plays the you know dirty rotten cheater sound uh, MP3. <laughs> Cheaters never prosper, and just displays that image you know in a message box that pops up. Name window, okay, and this is just going to set some attributes of our window, and that that has a separate. That's where that separate window pops up asking for the player's name, okay. So we just build. This is a child window of our main menu. We, we want it also to appear in the middle of our parent window. So that's the math that we're doing here. And we assign that to appear in the middle. And then this is the submit button handler. And we just close the window. We, we take that data, we get it from the entry object, and we set player name to be whatever they type in, you know, Carly or whatever their name is. And then we close or destroy that window, okay? And these are the objects that we've added here. You know, entry name, label name, and button name. And that's just our child window right there. TK enter widgets listen for events that are triggers, such as a mouse click or key press. When a widget detects its trigger event, it calls its corresponding event handler method. Here is our constructor. Remember, constructor is always underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Remember we always, well, not always, but usually, almost always, <laughs> you will take the self attribute. And then within that, that's where we code the, the functions, the methods that are the event handlers for all of our widgets, our TK widgets in our window that are listening for triggers, listening for events to happen. And when they hear that event happen, that trigger, they go and call the corresponding event handler function or method. So for my file view and help menu, these are all event handlers that get called when they click those menu items, okay? When they start, plays, you know, starts a new game thread and a separate thread outside of main loop, a whole different thread. When they click start, um, 
talk in this case. You know, they could they can talk. They can click on this, and uh, basically it'll just randomly say different things to sort of emulate or give them a feel for conversing with the you know the uh, player. So let's let's take a look at that. All right. Welcome to Casino Unicornio, every pony. Oh. Okay. Built my deck of cards. Deal to continue. All right. Let's make a deal. Click go. You're practically amazing, player. You nailed a perfect twenty-one. Awesome sauce. All right. <laughs> so, what if I want to do that? You know, and I, and I've won here, but ever wonder about the meaning of it all? Why are we here? What's your favorite color, Carly? Mine is purple. So it's just random conversation with the dealer, and you could get fancier with that. You could write like a chatbot and make it contextually sensitive. The player types in different things. You take that as string input and parse it. And if the string equals this, say that. And if the string equals that, say this. You know what I'm saying? You could get a lot more sophisticated with that if you want to. And maybe add some fun. But that's just sort of, you know, a very simple, quick way of how you would do that. Add some conversation functionality so the player can sort of chat with the dealer or the dealer can chat with the player in the course of a game. Okay? So handle button talk, handle button deal. Again, disable and enable buttons appropriately for that. Set booleans. Uh, if the player money is greater than zero, now remember we checked to see if it was a digit, if it was a number. We also need to say, you know, if the player's money is more than zero and the dealer's money is more than zero, then they can deal. They can make a bet. But if either the dealer or the player runs out of money, they can't. Hence the the decision structure there, okay? And otherwise, the player's out of cash or the dealer's out of cash, which again would would stop the game, right? Somebody wins, somebody loses, just from running out of funds in the game. The go button, and again, this is you know it's event-based programming. Every time they click the go button, this method gets called. Well. What happens? We have to decide in context what happens because the go button won't always do the same thing. The hit button, they take a card. Stay button, they choose not to and we'll close up the game. The bet button, they've clicked it. We go call the bet function. Okay, so that steps through all the code. Uh, I hope you have fun with this project. I hope you customize it and make it your own and uh, you know, go with your own theme. But if you go through this whole Python TK Enter project, it covers a lot of different Python topics we'll be talking about in this upcoming series of videos. And uh, you know, it will give you some great practice with foundation, uh, foundational objects in Python and in TK Enter.